We turn to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer, to ask the First Minister what engagement she has planned for the rest of the day. First Minister. Well, firstly, can I welcome Ruth Davidson back from Birmingham. I hope she's thoroughly ashamed of the xenophobic rhetoric she's been surrounded by over the past few days. Later today, Presiding Officer, I have engagements to take forward the Government's programme for Scotland. Ruth Davidson. I assume even the First Minister would acknowledge that I made my positions at party conference Absolutely. perfectly clear. Presiding Officer, today's report from the Fraser of Allender Institute spells out plainly the challenges that Scotland, along with the rest of the UK, will face over the coming years as we leave the European Union. Like most members of this chamber, I didn't vote to leave the EU. But the question now is about how we maximise opportunities ahead and, yes, of course, mitigate risks. The report says that the focus must now be on areas like food and drink and on manufacturing. So can I ask what work the Scottish Government is doing to ensure that these two sectors get protection from risks and take advantage of opportunities? First Minister. Well, it is a bit rich to be asked what this government is doing to protect Scotland from the risks when these risks have been created by the Conservative Party that Ruth Davidson is a member of and leader of here in Scotland. But as I have said repeatedly in this chamber and indeed outside this chamber, this government will do everything in its power to protect Scotland's interests and to mitigate the serious risk that Scotland now faces, risks that are set out quite clearly in the Fraser of Allender report today. We are working intensively with all sectors across uh, our economy. That work has been led by our economy secretary and by Mike Russell, who I've appointed to deal specifically with the Brexit negotiations. Uh, and it's not just manufacturing and food and drink. Uh, earlier this week, I sat down with the financial services sector to discuss the real concerns they have, uh, not just about Brexit, but about the growing uh, indications that what we are heading for under the Conservatives is the hardest of hard Brexits. Unlike Ruth Davidson, my position hasn't changed. Uh, I continue to think that Brexit is a bad idea and therefore I continue to think it's my responsibility to do everything I can to protect Scotland from it. Ruth Davidson. Well, let's talk in more specifics about specific things that this government could do to drive Scotland forward as we go through this period. The First Minister's government is today expecting an announcement on underground coal gasification. Uh, let me quote Graham Blackett, the head of Bigger Economics and a member of the First Minister's own Growth Commission. He says that subject to the robust planning and regulatory process that we rightly have, there are major advantages in being the first movers in this technology and becoming a world leader. Now, I know that the First Minister is restricted in what she can say, but her own adviser thinks that we could use this type of new technology to boost thousands of jobs and add billions of pounds to the Scottish economy. Does she agree? First Minister. Well, I'm sure Ruth Davidson is aware that the United Kingdom government is also looking carefully at the issues around uh, UCG uh, right now, and I'm sure she's aware, perhaps more aware than I am, of the direction of travel uh, that they might be going in as well. Uh, I think Ruth Davidson, as she did last week, seems to want to suggest that we should actually ride roughshod uh, over evidence and over the reports that we ourselves have commissioned. Uh, Paul Wheelhouse will make a statement to this chamber this afternoon. Uh, he will report on the work that we have asked Professor Campbell Gemmel to undertake on our behalf. Uh, all members of this chamber, indeed everybody across the country, will be able to look in detail at that work and Paul Wheelhouse will confirm the conclusions that the government has reached as a result of the work that we asked to be undertaken. I think that's the responsible way to proceed uh, because it's uh, putting uh, the concerns that people have and the interests of our environment and our economy at uh, front and centre and reaching balanced judgments uh, as a result of that work. That's the way we will continue to proceed on this important matter. Ruth Davidson. In the same way that people can still, by going on the Scottish Government website, look at the last report you commissioned on fracking, Absolutely. whose advice you didn't take. Yes. But let's move to another sector emphasised by today's Fraser of Allender report, and that sector is food and drink. Whiskey producers tell us that Latin America, a market of 600 million people, has a potential for massive growth in the coming year. And yet, south of Texas, Scottish Development International has only one tiny office. So like me and the First Minister, the Scotch Whisky Association didn't want us to leave the EU. But they now want us to focus on developing opportunities. So can I ask, what action is the First Minister taking to expand our trade footprint around the world? Okay. First Minister. 
Right, well, let's, let's just uh, walk ourselves step by step <laughs> through that question. Firstly, uh, those who know what they're talking about around UCG and fracking will note that Ruth Davidson uh, managed to switch between the different technologies there. Now, I don't know whether she did that uh, in full knowledge or whether she needs to do a bit more homework. What we're talking about today is underground coal gasification. That is a very, very different technology to fracking. And before she comes to this chamber to ask questions about that, I would have thought she might uh, know and understand that. Sure. Uh, secondly, on whisky, I met with the uh, Scottish Whisky Association uh, last week or, or the week before. Uh, the issues uh, they wanted to raise with me were firstly the success of the Scottish whisky industry, but also the real concerns they have about Brexit and the likely impact on them of that decision. In terms of our international presence, I'm sure if uh, anybody here was to go and do a quick Google search, they would find plenty of examples of the Scottish Conservatives criticising the international presence Absolutely. of the Scottish Absolutely. Government, saying things like, it's nothing to do with us, we should leave these matters to the UK Government. Absolutely. Well, thankfully, we don't listen. Uh, so as well as the excellent work that SDI are doing, and of course we are considering carefully uh, how we make sure SDI is properly equipped in the climate that we have now been put in as a result uh, of the recklessness of the Tory government. We've also announced recently the opening of new investment hubs in London, in Dublin and Brussels, making sure that we are not reliant on the likes of Boris Johnson to represent us overseas. We have the ability to do so ourselves. Ruth Davidson. The First Minister seems more interested in that this afternoon in discussing my position than her government's own, and I don't believe I've ever hidden it. My position is to say that people from the EU and elsewhere are welcome here and that this is their home. And my position is to retain the closest possible trading relationship with our European friends and neighbours while expanding trade abroad. But my position is also to face up to the realities ahead of us, to mitigate risks and to take advantage of opportunities. And this Parliament now faces a choice about whether to put the lion's share of its efforts into examining practical solutions or simply complaining about the results. So which is it to be, First Minister? First Minister. Well, I, think, I think Ruth Davidson uh, is perhaps protesting a bit too much. She says I'm more interested in her position. Uh, I have to say, if anybody can work out what Ruth Davidson's position is on these matters any more, then they're doing better than me, because she has flipped and flopped and flipped and flopped over and over again since the referendum result. And she says, and I commend her for it, she said uh, yesterday, what I stood up and said the morning after the EU referendum, that people who've chosen to make their homes here are welcome here, they make a contribution, we want them to stay and continue making that contribution. Unfortunately, the difference between Ruth Davidson and I is this. She wants control over immigration to stay in the hands of the xenophobes. I want it to come into the hands of this parliament so that we can put these sentiments into practice. And lastly, presiding officer, Scotland finds itself now in a situation we didn't ask to be in. We are in this situation facing all the risks we face because of the recklessness of the Conservative government at Westminster. My job and the job of this government is to protect Scotland's interests and that is exactly what we will continue to do. Question number two, Kezia Dugdale. To ask the First Minister when she will next meet HIV Scotland. First Minister. Uh, as an organisation almost fully funded by the Scottish Government, uh, officials of the Scottish Government have regular contact with HIV Scotland. Indeed, the Minister for Public Health and Sport last met with the Chief Executive of HIV Scotland on the 23rd of August. Kezia Dugdale. President Officer, across Scotland this morning, tens of thousands of people stood on station platforms as they started their daily commute. As Minister for Transport in October 2014, Keith Brown said the new franchise agreement awarded to Abellio was a world-leading contract to deliver for rail staff and passengers. Not only that, but it was a contract that will benefit the whole of Scotland. Does the First Minister believe that those promises to passengers have been kept? First Minister. The contract was awarded because uh, it was considered that it was the contract in the best interest of passengers across Scotland, but it is absolutely incumbent on Abellio 
as the holder of that contract to continue to make sure that they deliver services that meet the expectations of the travelling public. Uh, and the Scottish Government uh, will continue to liaise on an ongoing basis uh, with ScotRail to make sure that is the case. Indeed, I'm delighted that uh, the recent dispute around uh, driver-operated doors has been settled and uh, the public don't have the expectation of further uh, industrial action episodes as a result of that. Kezia Dugdale. President Officer, I doubt commuters on the morning train from Dundee to Edinburgh or North Berwick to Edinburgh or the nightly commute from Cumbernauld to Dalmuir would agree that Scotland has a world-leading contract or indeed that the expectations of the public are being met. In the past few months, Scotland's rail passengers have faced cancellations, delays and overcrowding. New figures this week show that a third of all routes in Scotland have services that are late more often than they are on time. And at the same time, Abellio are raking it in. One million pounds a month of profit from that franchise. So does the First Minister agree that while Scotland's rail network might be working for the transport bosses, it's certainly not working for Scotland's commuters? First Minister. Kezia Dugdale is right to raise concerns of the travelling public because the travelling public have a right to expect services that run on time and that they can rely on. And it's because the Scottish Government is so uh, firm in that commitment that Kezia Dugdale, I assume, uh, is aware that under the contract terms, the Scottish Government requested uh, from ScotRail on the 26th of August an improvement plan, which was then received on the 16th of September. We are absolutely committed to working with ScotRail to deliver a quality service to passengers. That is our responsibility and we are serious in make sure, making sure uh, we discharge that responsibility. That's interesting, President Officer, because I've got that improvement plan in front of me. In fact, it's a boast of a press release from Hamza Youssef this week. £3 million worth of extra investment to improve passenger comfort and accessibility on our railways. One of the things it says is that you're going to spend money on a passenger counting equipment so you can see how overcrowded the trains are. Can I suggest to the First Minister she just gets on one to appreciate how overcrowded the trains are? She needs to be honest about the experience faced by passengers, because here's the thing. Since 2011, the average weekly earnings of commuters rose by only 6%. But the Scottish Government's cap on rush hour rail fares increased by over 23%. So let me make that absolutely clear. That's a rise four times faster than earnings. Those who travel to train by, for their work every day are paying more for a shocking service. And Scottish commuters are fed up of the First Minister's excuses. This is her responsibility. What is she going to do to get things back on track? First Minister. I don't think anybody listening to this exchange will have heard me make any excuses. What I've said is our responsibility, working with ScotRail to make sure that quality service is delivered. That is exactly why the Transport Minister has been taking the action that he has been taken and it's why we continue to invest significant sums of money in the rail network to make sure that that uh, responsibility is discharged. Uh, I uh, do not uh, quibble at all about Kezia Dugdale's uh, right to come to this chamber to raise these concerns. I understand uh, the concerns of the travelling public but my job and the Transport Minister's job is to go on with fixing the problems not just to cart from the sidelines. A couple of supplementaries. The first one from Bruce Crawford. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Would the First Minister confirm that she's aware that HSBC are intent on relocating around 200 high quality jobs of this lot across you? Just listen to what I'm saying from Stirling. And does she agree that this will have an obvious impact on individuals and the local economy? And given this disappointing news, does the First Minister also agree with me that this strengthens the case for Stirling to successfully secure a city deal based on their excellent business case? First Minister. Um, well, I, of course, am aware of the situation at HSBC. I fully appreciate uh, how anxious a time this is for the company's employees and their families. Uh, the Scottish Government will do all it can to support those affected at this time. Scottish Enterprise is already engaging uh, with HSBC to explore all possible avenues for supporting the business and its workforce. And, of course, in the unfortunate event that any redundancies do proceed, uh, our PACE organisation will be fully engaged. Uh, in terms of the Stirling uh, 
uh, city deal. I had a, a brief uh, conversation at another event uh, with leaders still in council about this uh, yesterday. I understand these uh, discussions are progressing well, and while no conclusions have been reached, uh, I hope uh, that Bruce Crawford will uh, see from the experience in other cities, Glasgow, Inverness, Aberdeen, uh, that the government is very committed to taking forward city deals where we can. Neil Bibby. Uh, the First Minister will be aware that on the 23rd October, First Glasgow will make substantial changes to bus routes. This will affect many of my constituents uh, and will also affect bus passengers in her constituency and the Transport Ministers too. Under this government, the number of bus passenger journeys is down 74 million since 2007 and routes have been cut back by 66 million kilometres over the same period. Can I ask the First Minister how many more bus services have to be withdrawn before this government backs any form of regulation? And at the very least, does the First Minister not think it should, shouldn't be so easy for bus companies to walk away at short notice without any formal consultation from the communities we represent? First Minister. But, no, I, I think First Glasgow and indeed uh, all other bus companies should consult very closely uh, with local communities before making any changes to local services. That's what I would expect of First Glasgow. As a local constituency MSP representing the south side of Glasgow, I regularly uh, have discussions with First Glasgow about services uh, that run in and through my constituency, and I know other MSPs will do likewise. These are important issues. Uh, people in our constituencies depend on them, and I would expect uh, bus services to take their views into account when reaching decisions. David Stewart. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, will the First Minister join with me in welcoming to the Galley today a delegation of campaigners from the Danoon to Gurek Ferry Action Group from my region? Can the First Minister confirm that it is the policy of the Scottish Government to provide a vehicle and passenger ferry service between Gurek and Danoon town centres? And was David McBrain Limited, which is wholly owned by Scottish ministers, instructed to tender under the Gurek to Danoon procurement exercise? First Minister. Well, uh, firstly, I would welcome uh, the campaigners for the Dunoon to Gurek ferry service uh, to the Chamber. I know many of them well, as uh, in one of my previous uh, government jobs, uh, I had the responsibility for taking forward uh, this work. Uh, I absolutely appreciate the strength of feeling uh, around the town centre to town centre uh, vehicle service uh, issue. Uh, I know the member will appreciate, though, that now that we are in a live procurement exercise, there are strict limitations on ministerial involvement in that tendering exercise and what I'm able uh, to say at this stage. But I hope uh, he will appreciate and indeed the campaigners will appreciate from my previous involvement uh, how serious we are in seeking to make sure there is a service at running in that route that meets the expectations of those who rely on it. Question number three, Willie Rennie. Uh, to ask the First Minister what issues will be discussed at the next meeting of the Cabinet. First Minister. Uh, matters of importance to the people of Scotland. Willie Rennie. Uh, we've heard the Conservative International Trade Secretary branding European citizens working here as cards in an EU negotiation. We've heard the Conservative Home Secretary advocating listing foreign workers. These cards, these foreign workers, are our neighbours and our friends. They are our family. People who voted for Brexit across the UK did not vote to send their friends home. So what can she do to ensure that EU citizens are treated with respect and dignity in these negotiations? First Minister. Well, the first thing I can do, uh, which is what I, I did do in the morning after the EU referendum, is say unequivocally that people who have come from other European countries, or indeed from any country, and chosen to make Scotland their home and make a contribution uh, here, are welcome here. This is their home, this is where they belong, and it is where we want them to stay. Uh, and all of us have a responsibility to say that as often as we possibly can. Uh, we have also, uh, since the EU referendum, uh, taken steps to liaise with uh, the community of EU nationals living in Scotland. Uh, the Cabinet held uh, a question and answer session uh, a number of weeks ago uh, in order to hear directly their concerns. We've taken some practical steps, for example, around uh, university tuition fees to give some reassurance uh, to EU nationals where we can, and we will continue to look for other areas in which uh, we can do that. Uh, unfortunately, and, and you know, it is a matter of real regret to me that I do not have the power to guarantee the right of EU nationals to stay here in Scotland. Uh, so what I will also continue to do, and I hope I will have the backing of every single person in this chamber when I say this, and that is to call on the UK government to stop using human beings as bargaining chips and give them the guaranteed right to stay where they belong here in Scotland. Really ready.
Now, many of these European citizens work in places like Amazon. They deserve decent treatment too. This week, Amazon celebrated recruiting more people below the proper living wage. It was described as a bonanza. I have raised this issue before, and action was promised by the First Minister, but nothing has changed. This week, the Scottish Government didn't utter a peep, not one word of criticism. This is Amazon that's had millions of pounds of Scottish Government grants paying poverty wages. Does she still intend to do anything, or has she lost interest? First Minister. I think that is a really unfair criticism for Willie Rennie because he knows, uh, and I know he agrees with this, how seriously we treat the issue of the living wage. And we encourage, and I would go further than that, and say we expect uh, all companies where they can to pay the living wage. And we've taken a real lead in this. Uh, I wish I had the power here in Scotland, not just to guarantee the right of EU nationals to stay, but actually to legislate uh, on minimum wage level so that we could raise the statutory minimum wage to the level of the living wage. So let's argue not just for companies to do the right thing, let's argue for having some of these powers in the hands of this parliament so we don't have to simply call on the UK government to do the right thing for us. A number of supplementaries. Claire Hockey. The First Minister will share my concerns at today's news that a hard Brexit could cost Scotland 80,000 jobs. The Fraser of Allender Institute report shows that the weaker our economic integration with the EU, the greater the negative impact. Does the First Minister think that it is high time for the Tories to stop to drop their bluster over leaving the single market and at long last reveal a plan? First Minister. Well, the Tories should have had a plan uh, to deal with this before the referendum. It's absolutely shocking that they didn't have that. It's equally shocking that three months on, we still have only the sketchiest of details about what happens now. Unfortunately, the details we do have suggest that we are heading uh, down the road of a hard Brexit, which, as the Fraser of Allender Institute report says today, will cost people in Scotland in terms of lost wages and lost jobs. That is completely and utterly unacceptable. What I think has been really clear from the Conservative conference this week is that decisions by the Prime Minister are being driven more by her desire to appease the Tory right than they are by the genuine interests of the country. I think that is wrong, I think it is regrettable and I think it is deeply irresponsible. Douglas Ross. Thank you, Presiding Officer. When Andrew Flanagan, the Chair of the Scottish Police Authority, was asked yesterday about public concern over sex offenders and violent criminals being tagged, he said, and I quote, I think that worry would be understandable. Can the First Minister assure the public that her government will not use the extension of electronic monitoring for these criminals, given the very real concerns that have been voiced by the public and victims of crime? First well, public safety is at the heart of all of these decisions. As uh, I've said previously in an exchange just a couple of weeks ago, it is not for politicians to decide sentences. It is for courts to decide appropriate sentences. But when a court is deciding uh, the appropriate sentence in any case, whether that is prison or an alternative to prison, and uh, including the use of electronic monitoring, then risk assessment and issues of public safety uh, will be absolutely integral to that decision. That's right and proper, and the public would expect no less. Daniel Johnson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, as the First Minister is no doubt aware, uh, two weeks ago today there was a very major rupture on the wa in the water main supplying Edinburgh um, that occurred in Liberton in my constituency. Um, the destruction that was caused was very substantial. Many families have had to vacate their homes. And frankly, the only reason there wasn't a loss of life was because an elderly couple are currently in a care home where the, the, most, uh, the greatest destruction took place. I had a very constructive meeting with Scottish Water on Tuesday this week, but it was revealed that the main uh, regulating valves for the supply of water to Edinburgh are causing serious issues for Scottish Water to the point where they're supplying 24 hour supervision. The same valves are also used um, to regulate the supply of water in, to Glasgow and the Mulgai. Will uh, the First Minister uh, assure me that her ministers are, are looking into this matter and uh, detail to this parliament what steps they're taking to uh, make sure that this issue is remedied? 
First Minister. Well, firstly, I, of course, am aware of the, the disruption and the concern that was caused to the member's constituents uh, as uh, a result of the incident he has uh, talked about, and I know Scottish Water uh, will deeply regret that inconvenience. Uh, I'm more than happy to ask the, the, the minister uh, with responsibility to raise the particular issue uh, that the member has brought to the chamber today with Scottish Water and ask him to correspond with the member uh, when he has Scottish Water's feedback on that. Tavish Scott. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Is the First Minister aware of the turmoil in the Crofters Commission caused by the intolerable behaviour of the current convener? Does she know that other commissioners have asked uh, for his resignation and that the previous Chief Executive, Katrina McLean, left because of the convener's behaviour and the pressure that is being placed on Commission staff? In those circumstances, will she and her Rural Secretary now take action to make the Commission work for Crofters across the Crofting counties without the disruptive presence of the convener? First Minister. Well, Tavish Scott raises uh, a very important issue. The Cabinet Secretary for the Rural Economy has already welcomed the apology from the Board of the Crofton Commission, but it is disappointing that the convener was not a party to that apology. It's important that we get to the stage of being able to draw a line under recent events. The resources spent in dealing with these issues by the Commission uh, would, in my view, be far better uh, used in being an effective regulator and contributing to a sustainable future for crofting. I note that crofting commissioners have unanimously called on the convener to resign. Uh, the Scottish Government has requested further information from the convener in relation to last week's events. Uh, while the Government would not ordinarily intervene in the internal operations of an independent statutory body, the legislation does give Scottish ministers power to act if required. Uh, and I can assure Tavish Scott that the Cabinet Secretary continues to monitor the situation very closely and would be very happy to discuss it further with uh, Tavish Scott. Question number four, Christina McKelvey. Thank you very much, President Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to the recent Scottish Social Attitude Survey, which shows that levels of prejudice in Scotland are falling. Minister. Well, I welcome the findings from the survey. It's encouraging to see that Scotland is becoming a more inclusive society with more people embracing and valuing diversity. However, we shouldn't be complacent. It's completely unacceptable that some groups in society do still face prejudice. So we need to continue to work together to eradicate discriminatory attitudes in Scotland. Uh, and I can assure the member that this government is absolutely committed to doing so. Can I, can I thank the First Minister for that answer and that commitment? This week, its Tory party conference saw the most disgraceful display of reactionary right-wing politics and living memory, with the Tories hinting that they will target foreign workers and name and shame businesses for not hiring British employees. We perhaps saw an early glimpse of that from the Scottish Tories in recent weeks when they que questioned Christian Allard's right to take part in public life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How will the F First Minister work to ensure we build a tolerant, inclusive Scotland where people are judged on the contribution they make to our society and not by the place they were born? Yeah, yeah. First Minister. Well, we do that. We do that by standing strong and, I hope, united in defence of that inclusive, tolerant society. We should value people uh, by the contribution they make here, not by where they were born or indeed the colour of their passport. Um, I think that work is undermined by some of the rhetoric we've heard from the Tory conference this week. You know, Theresa May's speech uh, yesterday was endorsed by Marine Le Pen, the leader of the French far right. Nigel Farage uh, said yesterday that virtually everything that Theresa May said in her speech were things that he had said over the last few years. I do think all of us have an obligation uh, to stand up against intolerance, against prejudice, against discrimination and against xenophobia in all of its forms. And I hope everybody in this parliament will do so. Ross Greer. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The First Minister has already called out the hateful, disgusting rhetoric that came out of the Tory party conference this week. Perhaps the most sinister of their proposals was that from Amber Rudd, the Home Secretary, that companies will be forced to disclose the proportion of their workers who were born outside of the United Kingdom. Will the First Minister and the Scottish Government support businesses in Scotland who refuse to comply with this disgusting proposal? 
First Minister. I, I would absolutely stand full square beside any company that refused to comply with any request uh, to publish details of foreign workers. Uh, what I found particularly offensive was the idea that companies would be named and shamed uh, for the foreign workers they employed, as if there was something shameful about employing workers from other countries. It is absolutely disgraceful. Uh, I know Amber Rudd went on the radio yesterday morning and tried to roll back uh, from this proposal by saying that it wasn't something the Tories were definitely going to do. Well, I think it's about time the Tories stood up and said this, that it's definitely something they will not ever do because it would be downright disgraceful and disgusting and this government would have absolutely nothing to do with it. And that's our work. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. First of all, can I associate myself with the comments the First Minister has made about the Tory party conference? I think all of us on this side would be in fully in agreement with her on that point. It, we welcome the broad findings from the Social Attitudes Survey, as well as figures out last week which showed that hate crimes in Scotland had actually fallen over the last year. But we can't be complacent, First Minister. We still have bad things happening in Scotland uh, too often. For example, in the last year, Islamophobic hate crimes have increased by 89%. Prejudice and hatred has no place in any of our communities and certainly not in any part of our society. So what specific action will we take to highlight the issue of Islamophobia and to reduce hate crimes such as this? First Minister. Firstly, I agree absolutely with Anas Sarwar's comments. Indeed, I did say in my first answer to this question that we should not and must not be complacent. So there is no disagreement whatsoever from me on that. We do see a rise in Islamophobia. The, the government continues to work with faith communities and indeed through all of our equality work to combat discrimination in particular, to combat the rising trend of Islamophobia. We've seen I was speaking at an event at the end of last week on Friday night organised an interfaith event organised by the al Bayt Society uh, where I made specific mention uh, of the uh, need to make sure that we continue uh, to welcome the fact that hate crimes have fallen but not in any way be complacent about that. So uh, I know Anas Sarwar is very familiar with the, the range of work we do uh, seeking to work with communities uh, to bring people together to make diversity something we celebrate as a key strength of our country not something that we should fear and exploit. That will always be the way this government uh, behaves and conducts itself and I hope in doing so we will continue to have the unanimous support of everybody in this chamber. Murder Fraser. Right, uh, question number five, Donald Cameron. To ask the First Minister what steps the Scottish Government is taking to tackle the rise in the number of drug-related acute hospital stays. First Minister. Well, while drug taking amongst the general population is falling and indeed the number of young people taking drugs is at the lowest level in a decade, uh, we remain determined to tackle problem drug use. Uh, with our partners and supported by an investment of more than £600 million since 2008, we're working to reduce the harm caused by drug and alcohol use. The rise in the number of hospital stays is the result of an ageing cohort of drug users. The reality is as they get older, they become more vulnerable and that means they have a greater need for the support and care of the NHS. So we'll continue to work with subsector groups to identify and understand uh, the current and particular needs of these individuals. Donald Cameron. Uh, the First Minister will, will be aware from the recently published drug-related hospital statistics report that general acute emissions increased by almost 500 in the last financial year. The same report showed that around half of those patients lived in the 20% most deprived areas of Scotland. Would the First Minister accept that the Scottish Government needs to do much more to reduce serious drug misuse in our most deprived areas? First Minister. Uh, well, of course I will. Um, while we still have a problem of drug use, the, there will always be more that government needs to do. Uh, but I would uh, genuinely point uh, the member to some of the, the trends that I, I highlighted in my opening answer. Uh, we are now seeing the number of young people uh, taking drugs at the lowest level in a decade. And that would suggest that the initiatives we are taking are having some success. Coupled with that, it is right to say that we're seeing an increasing trend of hospital admissions. Uh, but that is related to the ageing cohort of, of, of drug users. As people become older, uh, having had a lifetime or substantial parts of their lifetime uh, taking drugs, then they do uh, more and more need uh, hospital treatment. And that's uh, the, the explanation behind that particular trend. Uh, but drug use, uh, 
in any community, but particularly in our most deprived communities, is something uh, we shouldn't and can't be complacent about, and we must continue to do everything possible to combat it. Kenneth Gibson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Does the First Minister agree that drug-related acute hospital stays are often related to illegal drug use? And can, and can she confirm that drug-related crime has fallen dramatically since the SNP came to office, with a fall of 45.7% in North Ayrshire alone, from 1,235 cases a decade ago to 671 last year? First Minister. Uh, well, I certainly uh, would uh, welcome and point uh, to the recently published recorded crime figures which highlight the reduction in drug offences in North Ayrshire and reflect other positive trends in that area. Uh, North Ayrshire routinely exceeds a national performance standard that expects 90% of people in need of drug or alcohol treatment to access it within three weeks. But as I've just said, in response to the earlier questions, we know there's no room for complacency. We know about the vulnerability of an ageing cohort of people who've been using drugs for many years, uh, and we must deal with that. Uh, but there is also, and Kenny Gibson's right to point it out, there is also cause uh, for optimism. Nationally, drug taking amongst the general population is falling, and as I've already said uh, today, for young people, it is now at the lowest level that it's been in a decade. So there's cause for optimism, uh, but we also must continue to tackle this problem because it's one uh, that affects too many lives and, and can often uh, affect those lives in a very, very dramatic way. Question number six, Jackie Bailey. To ask the First Minister what impact the breaching of EU spending rules has had on the funding of infrastructure projects. First Minister. In 2015, the European Commission suspended three European Structural and Investment Fund programmes. The suspensions prevented the Scottish Government from being uh, reimbursed for money it had already spent for the duration of the suspensions, uh, but there was no impact on the projects themselves. All suspensions uh, have now been lifted, uh, with the final one being lifted in September of this year. Jackie Bailey. Um, I think the First Minister has been badly advised in her response because I'm talking about um, European Statistics Authority um, it, regulations in relation to infrastructure projects. She's answered perhaps a different question, presiding officer. But the First Minister will hopefully now be aware that there are at least four major capital projects that breach EU rules on funding. The Aberdeen Western Peripheral Route, the Edinburgh Sick Kids, Dumfries and Galloway Royal Infirmary and the National Blood Centre. The total capital required for all four projects will be at least £900 million. And according to Audit Scotland, capital was transferred from housing and capital was transferred from Scottish water and £300 million was borrowed last year to fill part of the gap. Can I therefore ask the First Minister what further borrowing will be necessary to finance these and other planned projects? What's the opportunity cost if we still have to find the balance of the £900 million? And what projects will be delayed? First Minister. Well, I now understand that Jackie Bailey was talking about the ONS reclassification. I'm not sure how uh, anybody could have uh, taken that from the wording of her question. But nevertheless, uh, I'm glad we now have a meeting of minds on uh, the question that we are, are answering. As Jackie Bailey knows, the ONS uh, reclassification, and there are a number of issues, uh, we've seen one in, in recent weeks about uh, housing associations, where the ONS reclassifies from uh, private uh, to public. Uh, the UK government also has uh, similar issues to contend with. In terms of the capital projects she talks about, the Scottish government has made full provision for these. There have been no interruption uh, in terms of these capital uh, projects, and we continue to make sure that our capital programme is taken forward to deliver the infrastructure that the country needs and deserves. This time, Murder Fraser. Okay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. <clears throat> the Auditor General's uh, report last week tells us that a sum of £14 million has been lost from the Scottish Government's accounts due to its financial incompetence and its inability to comply with the EU accounting rules. Which projects have been cut or delayed because of this incompetence? First Minister. Well, I see Murdo Fraser made uh, the same interpretation of Jackie Bailey's question as I did. So uh, I should say my previous answer to Jackie Bailey stands in respect of this. Uh, in terms of the suspensions, the, the effect of the suspensions, which have all now been lifted, is to temporarily uh, prevent the Scottish Government being reimbursed for money we have already paid out to the projects. There is no impact whatsoever on the projects concerned. Now, we learn lessons, as other governments do. The European Commission uh, regularly and routinely audits uh, projects under these funds. We learn lessons, and we've applied those lessons in terms of the current rounds uh, of structural funding. I would say, of course, uh, that it is the actions of Murdo Fraser's party that's putting uh, the future of structural funding under so much threat. <laughs> 
Question number seven, Emma Harper. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to the proposed deadline of March 2017 for the triggering of Article 50. First Minister. Well, it does seem clear that the decision on the timing of Article 50 is being driven more by the Prime Minister's desire to appease the uh, Tory Eurosceptics than it is by any rational consideration of what is in the best interests uh, of the country. I do think that is deeply irresponsible. Uh, and as we've heard already in this session of First Minister's questions, we can see in the report by the Fraser of Ireland Institute this morning the damage that Brexit, especially the hard Brexit that the Prime Minister now seems to favour, will do to our economy. That is why the Scottish Government will continue to do absolutely everything in our power to protect Scotland's interests. Emma Harper. I thank the First Minister for that answer. Given the timescale it's taken for the Prime Minister to set a timescale, uh, what is the First Minister's best bet on how long it will take the UK Government to come up with a plan or any substantial notion of what Brexit means Brexit really means? First Minister. Uh, well, I, I have no idea how long it's going to take the UK Government to come up uh, with a plan. They should have had one by now. Uh, what I'm more concerned about with every day that passes uh, is the direction that the UK government does seem to be going down, not just exit from the European Union, but exit from the single market. Now, you know, let's be quite clear about what that will mean. That will mean uh, tariffs and non-tariff trade barriers to our companies who export to the European Union. It could mean our financial services companies losing their passporting rights. It could mean all of us having to pay for the uh, privilege of travelling across Europe. These are real implications for each and every single one of us. Uh, and that would be bad enough, but it's even worse because Scotland didn't vote to be in this position. So I hope everybody in this chamber uh, will unite behind a call from the Scottish Government to stay in the single market. Because I don't believe, uh, notwithstanding the result of the referendum, I don't believe Theresa May has any mandate to take the UK out of the single market. How many times did we hear the Leave campaign say that leaving the EU did not mean leaving the single market? So I hope Ruth Davidson uh, will go back to one of her previous positions uh, and again get right behind the Scottish Government when it says to Theresa May, keep the UK as a whole in the single market market and stop putting the interests of the Tory Eurosceptics and UKIP ahead of the interests of the country. Yes. Question number eight, Liz Smith. Uh, to ask the First Minister what discussions the Scottish Government is having with the governing bodies of sports, contact sports regarding head injuries. First Minister. Well, firstly, Presiding Officer, I, on behalf of Parliament, can I take this opportunity to convey sincere condolences to the family and friends of Mike Towell, who sadly lost his life following a boxing match in Glasgow last Thursday. Uh, the British Boxing Board of Control is investigating the circumstances of this incident and it would be obviously inappropriate for any of us to comment on the details at this time. On the broader issue of concussion in sport, as Liz Smith is aware, uh, we were the first country in the world to introduce standard guidelines for dealing with concussion in sports when the Scottish Sports Concussion Guidelines were published in May last year. These guidelines were developed with a range of experts, including the Chief Medical Officers at the Scottish Government, Scottish Rugby and the Scottish Football Association. They've been made available to all sports clubs and coaches for both contact and non-contact sports. Liz Smith. Uh, could I thank the Minister for that, First Minister, for that response? And could I also thank her for uh, the letter, the very helpful letter that she sent to me uh, this time last year following another FMQs, which I raised the same issue. And in that letter, she says that, that she fully recognised the seriousness of the issue and intimated that guidance would be updated on a regular basis. I wonder if these updates have taken place and whether consideration has been given to the fact that there is currently different guidance for serious concussion injuries in different sports. For example, in boxing, the suspension from the ring is a minimum of 28 days, whereas in rugby, the minimum is seven days away from the sport. Would she agree that the medical expert panel to which she referred in her letter might look to, like to look at whether there should be a standard approach? First Minister. Uh, well, as I said in my original answer, we have introduced standard guidelines for dealing with concussion in sports. But as I said previously, uh, when Liz Smith last raised this issue with me and was raising, uh, I think at that time, the prospect of legislation, which the consensus among, amongst medical experts appears to be uh, at this stage that legislation would not necessarily be helpful. But when I said uh, then, is, is what I'll say today, is we do need to make sure that we keep this under review and that as we do so, we are informed by the best medical opinion. So I'm very happy 
to take uh, the comments that Liz Smith has made today and make sure they are discussed uh, by the panel of medical experts that inform these decisions. And I'll be happy to enter into further correspondence with her when we've done so. Thank you. That concludes question time today. We'll now move on to members' business in Lee MacArthur's name, and we'll just take a few minutes to change seats.